and we're going to talk about parametric equations. So I remember when I first looked at parametric equations and the word parameter, I'm like, God, what's that? It sounds like something I should know. And I looked it up in the dictionary. And I got this very unsatisfying definition. It said something that varies. And, you know, I said something to myself to the effect of, you know, welcome to Facebook or something like that. Um, but <laughs> I, I was like, really? What is that? So something that varies. All right. Well, let's work with problem number eight as a nice example. And what we're going to vary in this case is T. T is going to vary. And we're going to vary T. Now, the, the, the book tells us that T is going to go between 0 and 2. So we're going to pick some friendly values for T. And I'll start out with T equals 0. Now, in addition to the book telling you that T varies between 0 and 2, they also tell you that X equals T minus 3. So what would that mean? Well, 0 minus 3 would be negative 3. How about for y? What would y equal? y would equal 4. Good. Now let's skip a spot and come down here to 1 and then down here to 2. We can fill in the numbers in between if we want, if we get really motivated. But let's just stick with the easy ones right now. If, x equal, if t equals 1, what's the value I get for x? Good. Negative 2, 6. And finally, down here, negative 1 and, good, 8. Thank you. Now, let's see what that means in terms of our graph. In terms of our graph, well, I started out here at t equals 0. I had this point, negative 3 and 4. And then I went to negative 2 and 6. And finally, negative 1 and 8. <clears throat> So let's plot these points. In fact, we'll have to plot them in order. So negative 3 and 4 would be up here. So that's where we're starting. And then negative 2 and 6 would be up here. And finally, negative 1 and 8. So we started out here, and we ended up here. And that gives our graph a little bit of an orientation. So play connect the dots here but the orientation is that it starts out here and it ends here okay so that's nice so really what I've got is a little piece of a line now sometimes it asks sometimes problems like this will ask you to you know just get rid of the dependence on t altogether that is, eliminate t and just give me an equation in x and y. So we can do that. Let's do that. So I've got x equals t minus 3 and y equals 2t plus 4. Right here, I can easily solve for t. x plus 3 equals t. And let's take this expression here and substitute it in for t over here. Well, that would be y equals 2 times x plus 3, x plus 3, and then plus 4. If you're careful about distributing things, you'll see y equals 2x plus 6 plus 4, or better yet, 2x plus 10. So if I eliminated dependence on t altogether, then I get the equation y equals 2x plus 10. And that actually makes sense. What can you tell me about this equation? What do you know just based on the form of that equation right here? Slope is 2. What's, what's the 10 tell me about this problem? It's the y-intercept. In fact... You can see that if you extended this line in a natural way, you'd end up right there at the y-intercept of 10. So this equation would be the whole line, but our parameterized version 
just gives you a little piece of the line and it traces it out in this direction. So, okay, not bad. Let's play around with problem number 10 and then we'll go back and take a look at these things in terms of doing them on your calculator. Or learn more calculator tricks. Are we okay with what we've got here for problem number eight? So the thing that's varying here is T. T is your parameter. Both of these things depend on the parameter T. Let's move down to problem number 10. In problem number 10, all they tell us is that T is greater than zero, greater than or equal to zero. So, okay. Well, kind of like the last one, I'm going to choose some very friendly values to plug in for t, because I don't want to have to calculate the square root of, you know, 3 or 7 or something crazy like that. Now, one easy value to start with is with t equals 0. If t equals 0, I get the square root of 0, which is 0, and 4 times 0, which is still 0. Okay. So I get the point 0, 0. But let's use our thinking cap a little bit. What's an easy value of t that I could plug in here? 2 would work because 2 times 2 would be 4. Square root of 4 would be 2. And 4 times 2 would be 8. So I get the point 2 and 8. But there's actually one along the way that we missed. Not 1. I want the square root of 1. So what would I multiply 2 by to get a 1? 1 half. So 1 half times 2 is 1. Square root of 1 is 1. 1 half times 4 is 2. So I get these points. And I suppose the next one up from that would be, say, 4.5. What's this line going to look like for 4.5? Square root of 9 is 3, and 4 times 4.5 is going to be, what, 20? No, 18. 18? Yeah, 18. So 3 and 18. So let's put these points on our graph. It's going to give it some orientation. You're going to start out at 0, 0. And we're just going to plot these points, right? And then it's 1 and 2, 2 and 8, and 3 and 18. All right. What's the shape of this looking like to you? If you had to say, well, it kind of looks like this, what would you say this is? That's not a bad guess. Um... And I heard a couple guesses. Uh, the one that's correct would be a parabola. Looks like a little bit of a parabola. But let's establish that by getting rid of the t and actually forming an equation in this case. So there's a couple ways you can do that. We've got x equals the square root of 2t and y equals 4 times t. I'd rather solve for t here that would get rid of the square root. Instead of taking t as y over 4 and putting it here, eh, I don't like that. So let's solve for y, or solve for t here. How could I get rid of the square root here? Square both sides. x squared equals 2t. x squared over 2 equals t. Plug that in here. I get y equals 4 times x squared over 2 or basically y equals 2x squared. And that's your rectangular equation. That's an equation that doesn't have t in it. It depends only on x and y. So we've got our graph. The orientation is this way. It's a good question. And I think what you've helped me decide is that we're going to keep going with some of the orientation 
and some of the questions here because different parameterizations can give your curve a different orientation. So it can be traced out one way or another, and it's going to depend on what you need based on your problem. So um, to that end, let's take a look at problem number 44. Problem 44, we're going to look at four curves. C1 is going to have x equal t, and y equals the square root of 1 minus t squared. And negative 1 is going to be less than or equal to t, less than or equal to 1. C2 is going to have x equals sine of t, y equals cosine of t, and 0 is less than or equal to t, less than or equal to 2 pi. I can flip things around in curve 3. x equals cosine of t y equals the sine of t, and again with the same range of values for t. And finally the last one, again kind of flipping things around a little bit, x is the square root of 1 minus t squared, and y is t negative 1 is less than or equal to t is less than or equal to 1. So that's the last of our curves. <clears throat> so what I'd like to do first is try and get a handle on what these figures are. I mean, if I'm looking at this saying, okay, I have no idea what that's going to be. Fine. Let's see if we can't solve for and eliminate uh, the t. So what can I do here? Well, I could square both sides, right? y squared equals 1 minus t squared. And from the first part of my equation, I can make a replacement here, right? This is really 1, one minus what? x squared, right? Because x and t are essentially the same thing. Let's make one more change to this. If I move this to the side, I get x squared plus y squared equals 1. That's kind of cool. That's actually literally taking us full circle. Does anyone know why? What's this graph of? That's the unit circle. That's the very first thing we started out with in this, this, this entire semester is the graph of the unit circle. That helped us define sine and cosine, and from there, we we're off to the races. So this graph is going to trace out at least some of the unit circle. So, all right, that's cool. How about this one? How am I going to eliminate the parameters here? And if your first guess is the inverse sine or the inverse cosine, stop. You're working way too hard, and it's not going to be pretty. So... Another way to do this is this. Let me square both of these. x squared would be sine squared of t. y squared is cosine squared of t. And then there's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take x squared plus y squared. And that's going to equal sine squared plus cosine squared. Hmm. Have I gotten rid of my parameter yet? Am I getting rid of my T? Mod seems to think I have. Somebody said it. Yeah. So again, going back to the origins of this class, right? Sine squared plus cosine squared equals T. If you remember nothing else for the final exam, please remember that little tidbit, okay? I'll feel like you got something out of this semester. So likewise, this one, and likewise, this one,
again, you can eliminate the parameters and find out that, oh, yeah, they're just, they're just variations of the parameterization of the unit circle. But what difference does this make here? Well, it's time to learn a little something more about your graphing calculator. So take out your graphing calculator, and let's put it in radian mode here, right? Now, it won't matter for the first part, but it will matter for the second part. Um, so let's put it in radian mode. And let's change something else in terms of the mode. If you go down to the fourth line, at least on the 84s here, let's go over to parametric and press enter on parametric so that parametric is flashing. Does anyone need to borrow a calculator today? A couple of you are looking like, oh man, I left it at home. No one? We're all good? Vivek? Jeldy? All right. Um, so, if you hit the Y equals key now, what's different? Yeah, it's not Y1 equals, Y2 equals. It's X1 and X2. So let's see here. X1 is T. Well, if you press, if you press the X key, guess what? It comes up with a T because we're in a different mode. So we've got T. And then the other thing that I want to do here is the square root of 1 minus t squared, like that. So, okay, looking good there. Let's see what else. Let's set it up so that it graphs between negative 1 and 1 for t. So that's a window setting. So hit your window setting and go from negative 1 to 1 for t, but unfortunately, I don't know where to set up my window. Well, I guess I kind of do, right? Because this is going to be the unit circle. So I really should set it up to view from negative 1 to 1, negative 1 to 1 on the y-axis as well as the x-axis. But here's here's a better trick here. Let's hit the, the zoom key, zoom fit. Remember where zoom fit is? Zoom and then zero. So zoom zero. That'll adjust your graph to just barely fit what we have graphed here. So you should see something like that. Doesn't exactly look like a circle, does it? It's a good question. T step for me is 0 0.009. So what happens is that your calculator starts out at t equals negative 1, plots a point adds this value, plots another point, and keeps going up until it gets to uh, positive 1. So you don't want this to be too small. You don't want it to be too big. Let's go with it too big at the first. So if I did t-step is 0.25, well, it doesn't give me a real good graph, right? That's a little too much. Um, if I did t-step is too small, 0.0001, uh, it doesn't like that. <laughs> yeah, let's try it again. Um, 0 0.001. Then, then it takes a long time because it's plotting so many. It's pointing, plotting thousands of points there. It's really brutally slow. So you want to pick something that's a happy medium. Uh, 0 0.01, 0 0.05. 0 0.05 should probably be pretty good. That's not too bad. Yeah. Now, I guess one complaint about this could be that it doesn't really look like a circle, does it? So if you want it to look in the proportion of a circle, do this. Hit zoom 5, and that will square it up. So then your circles actually look like circles. Did anyone notice the, the orientation of this graph? In which direction did it get plotted? started out at the negative x-axis and went over to the positive x-axis. So, take out your handout. Ooh, ah, come on, come on. Ooh, ah. Yeah, all right, some applause there. Look, this is already graphed for you. It starts here, and it finishes here. 
and the orientation is this way. So nice. So that's 44 part A. Let's take a look at a couple of the other ones. So the next one. Let's do 44 part B. That's this one with X1 is sine, X2 is cosine. So are we good with this one? Good with the orientation on that one? All right. So let's see. Let's change these up. You know what? I'm going to kind of keep them here. I'm just going to press the Enter key. So it takes the highlight off that, so it's not going to graph, but I can go back and graph it if I want to. Let's put in the next pair, which is going to be sine of t and cosine of t, like that. What's the, what's the range for t in this one? 0 to 2 pi. So for your window... Let's do 0 to 2 pi. Now when I press enter, that 2 pi is going to be replaced by 6.28, etc. You can probably get away with this as my T-step. Make sure your calculator is in radians. The range that they're giving you is 0 to 2 pi. I'm not talking about degrees. So let's graph it. Boom. Wow. You know what? I, what did I forget to hit? Zoom fit. So zoom, and then zero. Zoom fit. That should adjust things. And yeah, it looks like an egg, doesn't it? So if you wanted to pretty this up, what else can we hit? Zoom five. Yeah, zoom square. Nice. And that looks like a nice circle. So... The thing that you should catch in there is the way that that was drawn. So that's this one down here. That's 44B. And the start and finish are at the same place, but the orientation is clockwise. One of the things I'll ask you on exams quite often is to graph it and show the orientation. So make sure you pay attention to the orientation as they're they're being drawn. Okay. Let's keep going. Um, now there's a lot of different ways you can orient these graphs. It kind of depends on your need. But you can orient them so you start here. You can get half the graph. You can get the other half. There's a lot of ways you can orient this graph. It depends on the parameterization. How did you choose to parameterize these things? So is it worth it to go through these next two? Want to go through these as well, or kind of get the idea with the parameterizations? They, they change your graph. All these turn into you know, the graph of x squared plus y squared equals 1. It's just different parameterizations. Trace it out differently. Trace out different amounts. All right, so was that an A or an A on the last two? Want to graph them? All right, let's just do it. Let's just get rid of it. So, uh, again, I'll shut this off. I'll go down to cosine of T and sine of T. So just kind of mixing things up. Cosine of T and sine of T. My window settings should be good. So let's see what the graph looks like this time. This time I think we're going to start out at the positive x-axis and go counterclockwise. So that would be this one up here, 44 part C, start and finish. And again, we've got our orientation. The last one, and let's shut off these. Oops. Mm. Oh, are you kidding me? There we go. So this one is going to be square root of 1 minus t 
squared and t. Kind of as before, we got to go back and change our our values of t. We want to go from negative one to one. Step of 0.05 is okay. My window the rest of the way should be good because this has already been scaled to fit my graph in in sense of a nice square graph. So let's just catch the orientation. Wow, this one's kind of different. This one starts at the bottom and goes counterclockwise. So that last one would be down here. Start and finish. That's going to be 44 part D. You could, if you wanted to spend a little time, come up with orientations that start out here and finish here, here and finish here, or start out here and finish here. There's a lot of ways you can parameterize a circle, so you're really only limited by your imagination on this one. Problem number 20. Continue working with parametric equations and eliminating the parameter. Getting rid of the T. Kind of a little bit like that. That you're yeah you're converting between parametric and rectangular. And rectangular is just going to be something that doesn't have X and Y in it. I mean, it doesn't have T in it. It's just going to have X and Y. It's it's it's, it's kind of the same. Yeah, in in going from polar to rectangular, you got a nice substitution that you can make here. You got to be clever. So in problem number twenty, we've got two cosine of T, Y equals three sine of T. Zero is less than or equal to T is less than or equal to pi. So we're going to do a couple things here. We're going to graph this, see what it looks like. We're also going to try and eliminate the parameter here and do it that way. Which one do you want to start with? Do you want to graph it first or do you want to eliminate the parameter first? Eliminate the parameter first? Okay, sounds good. I'm open. Suggestions, what do you got? How can we eliminate the parameter here? We did one similar to this, but it's not quite the same. All right. I'm going to help you out here. What if I divide both sides here by 2? And get x over 2 is equal to the cosine of t. What else can we do? y over 3 equals the sine of t. All right. This should start looking familiar. We did solve one like this just a minute ago in problem 44. Square both sides. X over 2 squared equals cosine squared of t. Y over 3 squared equals sine squared of t. I still got my t, though. How am I going to get rid of the T? Brooke? Suggestions? What would we do with problem 44 when we're at this point? Yeah, we add them together, right? So, thanks, Robert. X squared over 2 plus Y over 3 squared equals cosine squared of T plus sine squared of T. What's that equal to? 1. So effectively, we got x squared over 4 plus y squared over 9 equals 1. Quite literally, it was just 
working on these kinds of equations with my college algebra class today. So if you're double dipping, if you're taking both classes, you should know this one. What's that shape? Does anyone know? It's a conic section and ellipse. Good. If these two were equal, if it was 4 and 4 or 9 and 9 here, then it would be a circle. But if they're not, you're going to get a slightly oval shape called an ellipse. Let's graph this on our graphing calculators and see if that it, it uh, fits what we expect. <clears throat> so let's see. Um, I'm going to just clear these one out. Clear those out. So 2 cosine of t and 3 sine of t. And we'll shut off these down here. Before I hit the, the graph key, there's probably a little bit more I should do. Does anyone know what that is? Yeah, you got to change the window. Thank you. So our value for t goes between 0 and pi. That means we're only going to get half of our graph. I think to get the whole graph, we're going to need to go from 0 to 2 pi. So 0 to pi. And then, you know, I'm just going to be lazy. I'm going to hit zoom 0. Oh, it doesn't like that. What's wrong here? Uh, window. Uh, oh, how about 0 to pi? There we go. Now we'll try zoom 0. And it's going to give me something that doesn't really look quite right. If you want it to really look a little bit more accurate, you can hit zoom 5 to follow it up. And that looks a little bit better. It's the top half of an ellipse. You can see that the vertice in the y direction is a distance of 3, or you can see it better here, 3 away from the center, and in the x direction to the left 2 and to the right 2 to find your other vertices. So here, here, your x vertices, and then up through 3 in the direction, this direction to find your y vertice. So there's your graph. So the window... Initially, what you're going to put in is 0 to pi. And once you put in 0 to pi, you can hit zoom 0. Now that's going to give you something that just maxes out your graph. And that's fine, especially if you know what you're looking at. If you can look at that and say, oh, yeah, I know that this graph ellipse, you can make it a little prettier by hitting zoom 5. And it's just a little bit more accurate to look at that way. How are we looking on problem number 20? Okay there? Um, let's take a look at problem number 24. X equals cosecant of T. Y equals cotangent of T. And we're going to go between pi over 4 and pi over 2. for t. I might cut over to decimals to graph this one, just because it's not going to be that pretty. It might be nice to look at the full graph. But in any case, wow, eliminating t is going to require a little bit more thought in this one. What's your instinct tell you? What are we going to do first? Amanda? I think I saw it on your, on your lips there. Square both sides. Thank you. And, well, last I checked, cosecant squared plus cotangent squared was not equal to 1. So I can't quite do it that way. In fact, let's remind ourselves of something that we should know come time for the final exam. Um, cosecant squared is what? What over what? 1 over which one? 1 over sine squared. And this is what? 1 over tangent squared, or in terms of sines and cosines, cosine over sine. So it looks to me like 
what you could do is take the Pythagorean theorem, that is cosine squared of x plus sine squared of x equals 1, and then divide everything through by sine. And let's see what happens when we do that. Unless somebody all of a sudden remembers the, the correct formula. So if I divide by sine, sine squared of x, sine squared of x, sine squared of x, I should get something that's starting to look helpful. This is going to be cotangent squared of x plus what? Plus 1 equals cosecant squared. All right. Now, if I wanted a 1 out of this, which term would I move where? Let's move the cotangent to the right-hand side. So I get 1 equals cosecant squared of x minus cotangent squared of x. And now I got something that would be helpful in terms of finishing this problem. How are we going to finish this up to eliminate the t's? I don't know how long this was frozen. I hope that doesn't mess up the video. We'll see. It might. In any case, um, how long, or excuse me, what do we have to do to, to eliminate the, the t here? Well, cosecant, that'd be x squared minus y squared would equal 1. And that's a hyperbola. So... 1 equals x squared minus y squared. You can graph that much the same way as we did the previous ones. Um, you want to take the time to graph that or no? We're good. All right. That's good. That was the answer I was hoping for, but I was giving you given the opportunity to avoid that. So what you would do is just put your parameter, your t between pi over 4 and pi over 2, hit the zoom fit key, and then maybe the zoom uh, 5 key after that. All right, last one. One of the nice things about parametric equations is that, is that it separates things, and you can study things independently. One of the early curves ever studied was something called a cycloid. And a cycloid is what happens when you roll a circle along a line, and it's going to be the, the point that is traced out by one of those points on the circle. You get a graph of a cycloid. Now, what's that? Mm, we can study a lot of things with four-year series, but um, I don't think we need to get that sophisticated to study a cycloid. In any case, think about where you'd use something like this. If you're in the auto industry, right? Study the motion of a wheel. Or if you have some parametric equations for the shock absorbers, you can look at the X and Y motions independently. So it is kind of nice. Now, what we're interested in, in this particular case is projectile motion. Projectile motion would be throwing something or launching something from a particular height, so h, at a particular angle with an initial velocity of v sub 0. So the motion is going to be governed by these parametric equations. And let me write them down on our paper, and we'll work with a couple, we'll work with a problem with projectile motion. So, projectile motion. I'm not going to expect that you have these equations memorized. It's not something that's really part of this course to memorize the equations. So, you can expect that if I ask a problem like this, I'd give you something here, v sub 0 times cosine of theta 
times t. And in the y direction, you'll see the influence of gravity, 1 half g times t squared. So there's your influence of gravity, plus v naught times sine of theta times t plus h naught. So let me review these. h naught is the initial height. v naught is the initial velocity. And theta is the you know, angle at which the ball or projectile was, was launched. So the angle with the horizon. So let's look at problem number 55. Let me put that up here for a moment. Suppose that Adam hits a golf ball off a cliff 300 meters high. So Adam's having fun, all right? Um, 300 meters high with initial speed of 40 meters per second at an angle of 45 degrees to the horizontal. So, all right, there's a few things we should get here. The initial height is 300 meters. The initial speed is 40 meters per second, and the angle is 45. So let's copy those things down. So h naught is 300 meters. That's really tall. Adam's got some courage standing next to a cliff that tall. Uh, meters, 40 meters per second. That's realistic. Nah, that nah, sounds pretty fast. That sounds really fast. Yeah, 40 meters per second. Let's see. If you're traveling 60 miles an hour, that's 88 feet per second. That's more like 120 some feet per second. So, yeah, I don't think Adam's that strong. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, even Phil Nicholson wouldn't be hitting it that fast. Okay. Let's keep going with uh, the author's fantasy here. Um, theta is 45 degrees. The first question says, find the parametric equations that model position of the ball as a function of time. So really all they're doing is asking you to put in this information into these parametric equations. So it would look like this. So part A is x is 40 times cosine of 45 and all that times t. If you're working in the English system, gravity is 32 feet per second squared. So one half of that's going to be 16. Does anyone know what it would be for the metric system? Well done, 9.81 meters per second squared. Again, not trivia that you're supposed to know. So half of 32 is 16, so it's going to be 16t squared plus, uh, let's see, where is it, 30, 40 times sine of 45 times t plus 300. It's going to take a long time for that thing to come down. But the first part is just finding the equations. So, okay, not bad. Then what? It says, how long is the ball in the air? Oh, my. That's going to be a long time, especially if you're starting out at 300 meters. The way to figure this one out is this. The ball is in the air until it isn't. And when it's not, what's the value of y when it's not in the air? The instant that it's no longer in the air, zero. So really what you have to do is you have to solve 0 equals 16t squared. And now it's time to figure out what this would be. Does anyone remember what the square root of, uh, never mind, <laughs> square root of 2 over 2 is? Uh, 40 times the square root of 2, that's going to be plus 20 square roots of 2 times t 
plus 300. And I'll wait while somebody factors that for me. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to pack off and go get some pizza. And... All right. Probably not going to have too much success factoring this. So what's your, like, ace in the hole? If you can't factor something, you leave it. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> I like that. That makes two of us happy because then it's going to be easy to grade. Uh, so your ace in the hole, if you're solving a quadratic equation and can't factor it, is quadratic formula. So that's going to be about, what, um, uh, 28.2... 28.24? That's not a bad idea. That's actually a really good idea. So uh, another way to solve this, if you are you young, game for that? You could graph this this equation and just figure out well where does it cross the y axis or x axis, right? So let's do it that way. There's nothing wrong with doing the Pythagorean theorem or the no, quadratic formula, I should say, but to graph this, we're going to have to reset our mode back into function. So uh, let me graph negative 16x squared plus 20 times the square root of 2 times x plus 300. And in the x direction... Let's go from 0 to, I think, I'm guessing 13 should be enough. And then I'm going to hit zoom. Uh, let's see, zoom 0. All right. So somewhere in here, the graph crosses the y-axis. No. Better than zoom box. So, kind of expected that to cross a little, a little later than that. But somewhere in here, it's going to cross the y-axis. So let's find it. If you hit the second key, then the trace key. Second, then trace. Then one of the things you can find is the zero. So you just got to be a little bit to the left of it. So use your arrow, get a little bit to the left of it. And then press press enter and go a little bit to the right of it. Press enter again. You've given it a little window, and it's going to look for where this graph crosses the x-axis in that window. So press enter one more time, and I'm getting about 5.3 seconds. Is that what you guys are getting? If you use the quadratic formula, you should get exactly the same thing. So t equals 5.303. So that's how long it's in the air. So it's determined the distance that the ball travels. Uh, okay. Well, if it's in the air for 5.3 seconds, how far does it travel? And we're talking horizontal distance. Well, this, this actually, this part of the problem is a little bit easier than in the first part, all you got to do is plug this in here for x. Because it's going to travel, you know, a distance x until it hits the ground, which is at 5.3 seconds. So it's 40 times cosine of 45. Actually, I'll put in, that's 20 square roots of 2. 20 square roots of 2 times 5.03. Hmm. 142 meters. That doesn't feel very good. Uh, no, it's, it's not. You'd plug it into X here. Mm. I just, yeah, I know. That doesn't sound right. Oh, you know what, though? Part of that velocity, excuse me, only part of that velocity is in the x direction, right? So
some of it is up and some of it is out. So that's why it's not going as far as we might think. Uh, in fact, if you if you take a look at this, 20 square roots of 2, it's really only moving 28.2 28, uh, meters per second forward, right? Because the other part of the velocity is going up. So a lot of your energy in hitting this ball is spent going up. That's why it's not going so far. So, all right, that makes a little bit more sense. Um, yay. Nice. Nice. Mm. It says, using your graphing utility, simultaneously graph the equations of part A. Nah, we'll skip that part. I think we're good with what we've got here. Now, on this one, if you wanted to, you could use a quadratic formula to figure out what T is. That should be negative here. You know what? Dang it. That's why this is wrong. Oh, man, I lost the negative. Well, I hate that. Did I graph it with a negative? Okay. So it's it's a good lesson. Two mistakes cancel each other out. So on the test, make sure you make your mistakes in even-numbered pairs. All right. So I think we're okay with there. If, if I have that, yeah, I do have that in the graph. Um, so, yeah, the rest of it should be okay. So let's declare victory and go home before I embarrass myself further. And let me assign you some homework. Um, <laughs> yes, the test the test will cover 5.3 through 5.7 and 6.7. So for the homework, try um, 15 through 25. And let's see a few more here. Um, try problem 43 and uh, 49. See ya.